we're shifting focus now um, into a field of research and practice which has been receiving increasing attention, uh, citizen participation. So we've seen a rise in citizens' assemblies uh, and other deliberative and participatory approaches, both locally, nationally, globally. The UNDP, for example, several years ago noted this deliberative wave. Um, it's talked about as a way to address failings in democratic processes, to strengthen democratic institutions, to address rising populism and distrust. This session is entitled People Powered Change and Visions for Participation in the 21st Century. Um, so who better to talk to this than two people who are leading some of the freshest thinking around these topics. Polly Curtis is the chief executive of Demos, the UK's leading cross-party think tank that for 20 years has been championing people-powered policymaking. They're poised to publish a citizen's white paper um, setting out why, when and how policymaking should involve the public at national level with Involve. Polly herself has spent much of her career at The Guardian, uh, where she reported on health, social affairs and education before joining the lobbying team as a Whitehall editor, writing about government and policy. She went on to be digital editor at The Guardian, has led <coughs> newsrooms um, at HuffPost, um, and her book, Behind Closed Doors, is an investigation into social services in England, published um, two years ago. It was a finalist in the Orwell Prize, and in it she sets a vision for a different way that state and communities can work together to solve problems. She also serves as a trustee of the Public Interest News Foundation and is a non-exec director of the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman. We're also um, talking with Rima Patel. Rima Patel is an experienced people-centred researcher and public engagement practitioner. She's head of deliberative engagement at Ipsos and has got a long-stranding record in engaging the public on emerging innovation, science and technology programmes. Rima established the Engagement and Participation Unit on AI at the Ada Lovelace Institute and was a policy analyst for the Science Wise program. She's a co-investigator investigator of Public Voices in AI, a program funded by UKRI um, and Responsible AI UK. She's advised Bank of England, Scottish Government, um, and Wellcome Trust on approaches to engagement and participation. She's the lead author of numerous reports on this topic, including participatory data stewardship, building a culture of economics and what works, developing a global evidence base for public engagement. So we'll be having a discussion here, but we'll also be taking some questions later from the audience. Um, so again, please use Hoover um, to wing those over to us as we go. So welcome, Polly and Rima. Thank you for joining us. We're going to be making a little portion. It's, it's what they call a fireside chat. <laughs> exactly. Um, so... Um, Let's get started. Lots to, lots to cover here, and, and when we spoke on the phone, I, I felt the conversation could have gone on for a couple of days. Um, we've got half an hour, um, but, but let's start with what's driving this interest in deliberative um, and participation at national and local levels. Is it a flash in the pan or here to stay? Polly? So I think it's being driven by the fact that we're stuck on a lot of things. We've really hit a wall in lots of policy areas where politicians, policymakers are really struggling to navigate the minefield of voter sentiment, the limitations of funding and practicalities. And we've really ground to a halt in a lot of policy areas. When you think about so social care and the numerous attempts to get reforms going, they always come a cropper. Um, and then you think about what we're facing in the future, and this is the bit where I get really depressing because um, it's a really challenging time ahead of us in terms of how we fix public services in the UK with, with so little funding available, how we navigate net zero, how we transform the way we work with AI. There are just so many big challenges and opportunities in that ahead. Um, that are, are going to take a different kind of discussion with the public to get the consent needed, because most of those big challenges are going to take some kind of personal sacrifice from people, and you need consent to get that. Rima, what's your take? So there is a really excellent report that was authored by the OECD on the deliberative way, which is the framing that you're using, and it was published a few years ago now, um, but what it demonstrated was that there has been a trend for probably just over 10 years of gradual interest so, and, and commissioning. So it mapped out the number of deliberative processes that have happened over the last 10 years. And if anyone had kept an eye on that, they would have seen that this is a trend. It's not a flash in the pan. 
Um, what's happened, I think, is the pandemic has created what I would describe as a participatory turn. So um, if you think about it, we were all in lockdown. We lost sense of agency and control, some of the things that are really important to us as a society. And then we're moving into crafting a new vision for a different world. Um, so what's happened since the pandemic has certainly been an exponential growth, um, but it's a, it's a growth that was already happening, if, if that makes sense. Um, now, the exponential growth is really interesting because it creates some challenges for us. There's a gap between where our practice was and where it needs to be. So we've done that. Um, and I'm really interested in what we need to do to, to address that gap. Because actually, if we just move into the scaling of deliberative and participatory practice without really having the resources to do this well, then for us, uh, that creates risk and it creates challenges. So I don't think it's a flash in the pan. Mm. I think it's a general trend. I do think that there's been exponential growth in appetite. And I do think that there is a gap. We'll come to that, to that gap a little bit later when we talk more about the mechanics of it. Um, but, but picking up on, you know, the, the, the sort of the vision for it, you're both great proponents of, um, of mm -hmm. participation and deliberative. Um, uh, and, um, you know, what, Rima, would you say is your vision on the role that it should be playing and can be playing in better democratic governance? I was thinking about this on my train um, on, on the way here. And I think, in a way, my vision is that participatory approaches are just part of the furniture. Um, you know, um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't really be having this discussion because it's just taken for granted the way we do research, the way we do um, engagement, and um, we, we shouldn't other it. So it's really embedded and it's part of the furniture. In a way, it's slightly ironic because I'm kind of um, arguing for the disappearance of my role entirely. You know, mm. the idea that you have a head of deliberative engagement um, only really makes sense when it's seen as something unusual or new. But um, if it's part of our culture, of the way we do policy, and our culture of the way we do research, then you don't need specialists. You need people who recognise the centrality of participation um, and engagement at the heart of research. Yeah. Polly, maybe you've got a white paper on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but just, <laughs> um, so, you know, mainstreaming, mainstreaming um, this work into, yeah. into practice. You know, your forthcoming white paper, as we've, as we said, is, you know, is about how citizen participation can be at the heart of government, that it should be, um, and how, when and where of using it, um, particularly around national policy. Right, so we're talking central government level. Yeah. Um, so please do, you know, if you can, give us an outline um, of the key arguments, you know, what you're arguing it should give us, um, you know, what it can achieve, uh, and also where you think that's going to take the biggest changes from current norms. Yeah. So uh, Rima just nailed it. It needs <laughs> to be normalised. It needs to be part of the furniture. I really, I absolutely agree with that. Kind of like consultations ha are, but much better. Um, and listened to and acted on, but but they're not they're not unusual. They're not questioned anymore, and or evidence based policy making. It just needs to be in our toolkit to get there. We're we're producing this citizens white paper, knowing that there is some appetite politically for this at the moment, and within the civil service. Um, but the key, I think, to making it real is getting that real political appetite um, to embed this. We're making a very um, sober, straightforward, practical argument that this will help you do the things that are hard at the moment. This will help policymakers navigate and overcome the problems they face um, in the current toolkit. Um, by deliberating and um, uh, participating with citizens, you can create <coughs> partnerships that get to the nuance of policy challenges. Um, on a very kind of high level, if you are guided by polling, you are constantly asking yes, no answers, kind of that don't go to the depth of the trade-offs that are required. So what we hope to show in this, is this white paper is how it will help an incoming government navigate some of the challenges it's had. 
it has about prioritization, about spending, and about kind of um, hard policy issues. We'll do that by showing kind of what the costs are of not doing this, of policy failure, failures where these questions haven't been, been asked. Um, and then we make another layer of, of argument um, for this, which is about trust as well. Um, and what, what we need to do with this whole debate is make sure that we don't slip into kind of the feel good, uh, more woo woo end of it, which I don't mean in any disparaging way because I've been in those processes and I feel good and I feel better about democracy and everybody who's been through those processes generally comes out going, I feel better about the world and my place in it. Um, but it can't just be about giving people voices. That's kind of for, for the get the political engagement. You have to show them how it's going to help them tackle their political challenges. So we're really focusing on that end. But one of their big political challenges is the lack of trust. Um, and so there's a, a, a kind of hard argument to make there that by deliberating participation, creating these new partnerships with the public. Um, you can start to rebuild some of the trust that's so lacking in the political system that it's preventing us making good policy. So that's the kind of case mm. we're making. Um, the specifics you will have to wait and see, but it essentially takes a few different approaches, a symbolic approach, an embedding approach, and um, a kind of a deepening approach that over time a new government could introduce different waves of innovations that starts with some symbolic um, uh, approaches, then embeds across government systems, and then deepens into the kind of governance system and does things like quality assurance and standards assurance and um, settings so that, so that you have real deep trust in the processes that you're embedding across the system. So um, there's lots and lots of detail, and it's been in, an incredible collaborative, participatory approach to get there. Um, the um, process has involved um, participation with the public, with a huge number of experts and policy makers, Rima and um, so many colleagues from across the sector have contributed their thoughts. One, one thing I would add about, one challenge mm. I would add, and one thing I'd say about governance in particular that I think is really important, is that for us now, this is about um, improving and building on a representative democracy. It's not about creating another kind of direct democracy or a different kind of representation. It's about empowering politicians and policymakers to make policy better through participation. But ultimately, the accountability and decision making needs to lie with those who are accountable um, democratically as, as it is. And that's critical because one of the challenges is that we need to get political engagement to embed this. Like the, the only, I think for a long time, everything Reem has been talking about over the years, this, this has been normalized in some places, but the heart of government at the very top, it hasn't. And to take it to the next level, it needs to be part of a political project to win back trust. And sorry, one, one, one of the kind of challenges um, that we need to come is, is overcome is, is the kind of cultural challenge as well. Um, I was really interested in Stian saying um, about uh, policymakers not wanting to admit they don't know everything and that they don't have all the answers. And so there's a kind of cultural change that needs to happen. And we talk about humble policymaking, where you go into a process and say, I don't have all the answers. And if I listen to the people who are most affected or who care about this or who are um, affected as taxpayers, I will learn something different about how I design a service, but also the Overton window for change around this. Ministers, be more like researchers. Yeah, yeah, be open to not having all the answers, and that's, that's not part of our political culture at the moment. Rima, I mean, you've got really wide experience working with policymakers, um, and some of this, is, as Polly's said, is about changing the culture yeah. of policymaking. Um, what do you think is needed to get this way of doing policy making more embedded with decision makers and staff, thinking about culture and incentives, and if there are any places you've seen that work well, what enabled it? Yeah, um, so there's a few initiatives that are really worth considering and thinking about. Um, the ScienceWise programme um, is a, a, a long-standing 
20 years plus um, capacity building program and public dialogue program embedded within government, but increasingly working across the research ecosystem. Um, I think that model works really well. It works well because it focuses on supporting policymakers to think about what issues are appropriate for public dialogue and public engagement. Um, and we've done a lot of work with ScienceWide, the Government Office for Science on Net Zero Futures. Um, we work with the Scottish Government on QCOVID algorithms um, to prioritise vaccine allocation, those types of, of issues. Um, so that's a really thoughtful and very strategic program. Uh, very few people know about it. Um, so there's a lot of learning from, from programs like that. Um, the other challenge is that um, an initiative like ScienceWise really struggles with the sort of ebbs and flows of the political system around where it's positioned, where it needs to be. And um, so the challenge here is the sort of pace of policy making and how do we make sure that there is adequate time and resources um, for an inclusive approach to policy making. Um, so around science-wise, arguably, there needs to be support and the infrastructure that ensures that there is a nexus between policymakers and the people who are delivering public engagement. Um, and as someone who has done a lot of this public engagement work, sometimes that feedback loop is the most important <coughs> bit, and that feedback loop is, is missing. Um, now, there, we're coming on to your question about governance soon. So there are ways to recognise that it's not just about the participatory practice, but it's also about the embeddedness of participatory practice in policymaking and creating the governance processes that make sure that what comes up in a public dialogue or citizens' jury doesn't just um, end up um, hidden or... or, or or, you know, it's there, but it's sort of in, on, on the back pages of a, of a government website, um, but it is actually being responded to. I do think organisations like Demos and Involve have a mm. crucial role to play in terms of um, spotting and identifying some of these opportunities and enabling that accountability. Um, so th th there's a really important role for the um, insider-outsider here, um, which, which is really helpful. So let's put that to Polly. Polly, you know, what, what are your thoughts on how you do get the governance right? You know, how do you help to avoid tokenism and even a, a sort of the, the backlash, the sort of further loss of trust? Um, uh, and how should we be evaluating how this is working? Mm. How do we sort of manage the risk of inflated expectations? So it, it's, it, it's interesting because the, the, the kind of sector involved is at a funny stage of maturity. And sometimes we've talked about in the team this kind of uh, participation paradox that has been around long enough to produce things like ScienceWise, which are so brilliant and so embedded in the system. You see everything that Scotland's done and Ireland's done and all over the world, and yet it's never tipped over into being central to a, to a theory of change about how we govern, and that's the challenge. That's the bit we're, we're inserting ourselves in now, and our, our working hypothesis around the work we're doing at the moment is that it needs the political appetite to make the change. You can't build it in the ecosystem and then it will transform the system because I think that has been done brilliantly by so many practitioners and in so many ways and it's kind of reached a limit of what it can influence without that political um, leadership around it. So, so the governance and, and the, the kind of um, system we design within the Citizens White Paper is really much very much depends on, on having that leadership from the top. And doesn't that leadership from the top and also sort of shared clarity depend on um, being clear about what um, uh, a participatory mm -hmm. process is for, what it's trying to achieve? Because of course there's a spectrum, isn't there? You know, it, deliberative research can be you know, used directly to provide better insight and in, in information. It could be about a dialogue to produce <coughs> recommendations. And sometimes there is a decision-making function say, involving participatory budgeting, you know, to have a direct say in what happens. So, you know, as well as needing clarity on that, so people could be clear about the purpose and accountable to it, you know, are you both sort of neutral as to the merits of all of those different functions? Or do you think there's a sort of value in pushing for the more um, sort of decision-making end of the spectrum where participants have a stronger stake? 
Do you, do you feel all of them are equally good um, or you've got a sort of value judgment? So Sherry Arnstein wrote a really interesting paper back in the 60s called The Ladder of Citizen Participation. And a couple of things, I've gone back a few times now to this mm. paper mm. because it's really interesting to see where the practice and the current conceptualization currently is at and then actually this paper. And if you're really interested in it, go back and read the original paper. It's an amazing paper. Mm. So a couple of things, she didn't position it actually as a spectrum. Mm. It was a ladder. Yeah. It then got changed into a spectrum. Then sideways. Yeah. Mm. So it sort of went like that mm. to that. That's an interesting observation. Mm. Let's reflect on that. Why, why did that happen? Um, the other thing um, that is very obvious from the original paper is that the spectrum or the ladder was actually about layers of power. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she, she articulated this as, as about low agency up to high agency, or in her actual word, low power to high power. So I think her views, my reading of that paper is that it's not really about the method. Mm -hmm. You could have the method, the method could be a citizen's jury, mm -hmm. but depending on where it's positioned in the ecosystem, mm -hmm. the citizen's jury could be low power, mm -hmm. depending on the sort of agency actually given to the people in, in the process. It's about the spirit of uh, the, the process and how it's embedded in, in, in the policy ecosystem. Somewhere along the lines, mm -hmm we lost that narrative. And so it's my, you know, um, ambition, as it were, to sort of encourage people to go back and read it. Mm. Um, the other thing that's really interesting in there is that she really engages with this question of structural um, inequality um, and flags that this is about helping to address and create more inclusive approaches um, and address equitable um, you know, create the conditions for equitable practice between um, minoritized groups and community and power holders. That bit has also been lost. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's something about re revisiting the original work and saying, is that the way we want to conceptualize it? Is it actually a spectrum of methods? Or are we talking about um, a ladder that r connects really clearly to Michael Young's point, which is about agency power, and control and where that sits. Now, of course, that's challenging because you know when you you're you're talking to people who have power, it's challenging to say part of this is about relinquishing that power. But if it's clear that that's the kind of journey that we're all on, and that to relinquish power means gaining power, mm -hmm. I think I think we've got a really interesting conversation to have there with the policymakers and and, and industry organisations as well some of whom are, are commissioning these approaches. Polly, how can I pick up on, yeah. yeah, can I pick up on the guess that's so interesting. I've not read that paper. I kind of think we should just all stop reading and uh, talking and go and read the paper now. <laughs> I, was, it's, yeah. I mean, it sounds absolutely critical, but it is also absolutely the thinking around the citizens white paper. But, but within that context, thinking what is the very practical opportunity now? And we don't advocate for direct decision making um, in this paper because we want to protect the idea of the representative democracy and really strengthen the way that's working. Um, and it's not to say in the future that things might change in that area, but the reality of now is that politicians don't feel very powerful at all. We've done lots of policymaker and ex-minister interviews to kind of, um, as an input to this, to understand the challenges of policy making, they really don't feel like they've got much room to manoeuvre. And our argument to them is that by doing this, you will have a greater opportunity to innovate and bring in new policies than you have at the moment. You open the Overton window um, by engaging with the public. So it's really about kind of empowering them to do better. And, and I also think we talk about power a lot 
actually this, uh, I think democracy is a lot about accountability and responsibility and politicians need to be on the hook. That's what we elect them to do, not, not the public. Great. Last um, topic before we go to questions. You've got a ton of questions. Um, uh, is, so we've so far been talking about central government. Mm. Um, let's turn the focus to local, local government um, uh, and, and services. So Reem, we're really interested in you know, how you see that working best at local government level. Um, and then Polly, you know, your thoughts on embedding participation in service delivery and involving in some services? So there's a huge amount of really interesting practice at a local government level, and um, you can see why that's the case. You know, um, often local bodies, public authorities are really connected to um, their localities. Um, the, that layer is almost the, it is the front line of the relationship between institution and citizen, um, and that's very much evolved with the um, uh, inclusion of um, initiatives <coughs> such as combined authority. So there's that, that, now increasing devolution. I've noticed actually internationally that when you've seen more devolved administrations, there is a much greater practice there. Yeah. The obvious challenge in the UK is the extent to which local government um, lacks resources and funding. Um, and and that, um, it's very, very difficult to have a conversation with um, a local authority um, that's in the Orkney Islands um, about, well, you need to do more citizen engagement when um, there are all sorts of challenges that relate to tackling um, the cost of living crisis and fuel poverty and so on. Yeah. So I think it's about... Um, you know, again, back to wider structural issues, but also ensuring that there's adequate resourcing and funding, and also ensuring that deliberative approaches connect to some of the, these challenges. So, you know, there are some really difficult policy choices that the local authority needs to make about the allocation of resourcing and funding. Can deliberation help with the navigation of those difficult choices? Um, I was involved in a really interesting public dialogue um, in Coventry and Warwickshire around um, how best to prioritise an NHS waiting list. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really came up was, well, we could have this deliberative process and we can have this dialogue about the NHS waiting list um, and, and, and the, the, the sort of variables around that. But one of the big challenges here is actually the resources. Uh, so, you know, you could, your waiting list could just grow bigger and bigger and bigger, um, and you can, you know, um, have a debate about how best to prioritise that waiting list, but actually if the waiting list isn't reducing, then that conversation um, uh, is, is sort of, um, you know, it's, it's not that helpful. Um, and that's a really good example of, um, you know, this question of who gets to choose the questions that are on the table, um, and certainly you can have that conversation at local level but there is a certain level of disempowerment and lack of budget um, that are impacting on on local authority that we need to take into account mm. absolutely um polly your thoughts on embedding participation in service delivery i'm going to try and do this really briefly because yeah. i know you've got your questions um but it's a kind of conceptual leap from decision making and policy making into actually how services are delivered in partnership between communities and individuals and um, and state workers. Um, so if you look at within children's social care, family group conferencing, where families are really brought into the problem identifying and solving, and rather than social workers doing too, they work with. I think that relational way of working is at the heart of our public service reform. And just one mention of a policy that we've worked on around this is a policy called Martha's Rule, which you might have heard of, which is about transferring power in hospital settings from clinicians to patients and giving them tools to trigger their own um, clinical review. And we worked on the policy design around that. There's a through line here about partnership and improving the relationship between the state and citizen. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so on to these questions, and thank you everyone for um, furious posting. Um, so uh, I'm going to put a couple together um, to you, Rima. Um, so one, um, and they're both about, about the practice. So, you know, deliberative processes, you know, often try to bring representative voices to the forefront, um, but often marginalised voices remain marginalised. So do you have any examples of where you overcame that challenge? That's number one. Number two, 
Um, uh, can you give some examples of an area where geography or policy where it's currently being done well? Okay. Um, very concisely, I don't think that you need to always have a representative sample for a deliberative process. So there's a paper I wrote a while ago that spoke about um, representative and purposive sampling. So you can use a process called sortition, where you aim to reflect a, a public. You can also use purposive sampling, which is, um, I mean, um, the, so essentially what you do is you look at the impact of groups and community. Good example is a science-wide dialogue on national DNA database that sought to deliberate with the people represented on the national DNA database. And that's a good example. Mm. So there's a very clear rationale, but that's the approach you would take or could take in that instance. Um, two for you, Polly. Um, first, are policymakers ready to act on deliberative and participatory findings, or will they just claim they lack rigour? And secondly, sort of looking back, citizens, juries and assemblies were around in the early 2000s. Um, the Cabinet Office had a whole people's panel. Local authorities used them widely. They were costly. They fell out of failure. So how do we ensure that this time around they do become normalised? Um, so on the costly side, so I think these things ebb and flow with yeah. political interest and it's where you can show the benefit of it. I don't think by any means everything needs to be a citizens' assembly. I think we need a range of methods um, um, for different approaches. Um, I think there absolutely will be kind of pushback and resistance um, it, like culturally in, in policy circles. Um, there was a story in the Times um, around Sue Gray uh, um, and her interest in citizens' assemblies. Um, and there was quite a lot of pushback um, from other parts of the Labour Party on that. And largely motivated by the politics around the... I mean, it's just office politics, really, um, and not about the substantive issues. Um, but that, that's, that's what you need to overcome. That's, those are the arguments we need to take head on and the change we need to make. And that's why we need a slightly different argument around it this time. It's not just about giving people a voice. It's about solving policymakers' um, problems and helping them do their job. Yeah. Um, and somebody has, has asked, so what, what, you know, if when it's doing it well, mm. what policy impact can it have compared to other more conventional approaches? I think it can get to the trade-offs in a, in a much clearer way. And I think there is something kind of very visceral for politicians and the policymakers to be involved in that process. Um, they can see where the public sentiment really truly is and, and see with much more clarity what the choice and where the manoeuvre is. It can bring new ideas as well. Yeah. Um, someone's asked on that point, is there a risk of... Uh, of it being siloed because you're building a deep focus on a specific topic mm. um, but in doing so do you risk missing a bigger picture around sort of upstream and downstream impacts more investment um, I mean the, the whole point is it opens, it opens up scope up. for that in a way that lots of research methodology so all is don't in scope. At the moment. All, yeah. all conversation potentially yeah um, when's your white paper out it, uh, June 20th, it was July something, and then someone called an election, and we thought... <laughs> and, and there was more interest, actually, in it, um, politically, so we, we needed to work faster. Um, an interesting point <clears throat> being raised um, that I've also seen a lot in the social sector, sort of charities around participation and involvement, the sort of the assumption of an interest. Um, you know, what if certain communities don't want to participate or don't have the capacity to do so? Um, and how do you manage um, raising expectations um, through participation that are then not met? I mean, I think you have to put incentives in place, but I think Rima... Yeah, I, um, I think that there is something which is about understanding why um, and whether that's a structural reason. So then can the structural reason be overcome? But you're absolutely spot on that some people may not want to participate in a process depending on where it's come from, its positioning and their historic relationship with that. So I think it's also about acknowledging that participation cannot solve everything um, and, and a bit, having a bit of humility about the role of participation too. Um, so it's a part of a suite of broader approaches and methods and it is not appropriate for every single um, issue.
Um, last, last question um, before we close. Risks around AI hype about the potential for large language models um, to interfere, stand in participants, um, uh, short circuiting, sort of preventing genuine deliberative approaches. Have you, Rim, you've, you've done a lot on this topic more broadly. Do you have any thoughts on that particular risk? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big um, advocate for what I describe as society and human in the loop approaches. Yeah. So um, where are the most important points at which we need to involve human beings? I mean, real human beings, not synthetic AI focus group, which is what I picked up on last night, mm -hmm. um, you know, actual human being. Um, and then where are the points at which AI can support human beings and, and society? and mapping that out. And that depends on what, you know, what, what the sort of uh, research method looks like. But um, I think that that's, we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, and always being critical and, and asking that question whenever we are using an AI tool in the process. Mm -hmm. I agree with that completely. But we're working on an idea at the moment, which <coughs> is um, around AI in the loop. So yeah. actually flipping that model and saying human systems with AI in the right places rather than AI systems with humans in the right places. And that's a very interesting framing. I agree with that. Yeah. 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 Excellent. <laughs> well, agreed for now. Um, thank you both so much. Really, really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.